All right, so um, we'll start. Hello, my name is Vasilios Kuzmakos. Today is March 9th, 2022. Who do I have the pleasure of speaking with today? Sure, I'm, you, your voice is very soft. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Vasilios Kuzmakos. Today is March 9th, 2022. Who do I have the pleasure with of speaking with today? My name is Sandy Moret. Hello, um, Ms. Moret. So if you can just tell me a little bit about who you are, where we're at, and uh, that type of thing. So what do you do? Uh, okay. Um, I, um, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and moved to Miami in 1972 for a business opportunity. And um, fell in love with the, um, the resources of the Everglades and the Florida Keys, um, which uh, I had no idea what was here, but it's a treasure. And um, my business was very good to me, and I sold it in 1985. I moved to Isla Morada to goof off and fish. And um, I can't uh, goof off and fish. I had to do something, so I started the Florida Keys Fly Fishing School and Florida Keys Outfitters in, here in Isla Morada in um, 1989 for the school and 93 for the shop. And uh, we are a uh, uh, premier specialty fly fishing um, shop. We book fishing guides. We um, have uh, rods, reels, and um, apparel, as well as lifestyle apparel from Florida Keys. So that's what I'm doing here. So tell me a little bit more about the school, the fly fishing school. Um, the fly fishing school, yeah. we have, um, over the years, we're going on 30-something years now, um, we have anywhere from uh, 15 to 25 people. Uh, they come from all over the country, actually all over the world. Uh, they spend a two-day seminar with us, and we teach them um, about fly fishing in salt water. Uh, we do three to five a year and have done three to five a year for uh, that many years. And uh, we teach people how to cast, um, how to uh, rig their tackle, um, what species are available. Um, and then we arrange and let, get them out on the water to the fish with a guide for a couple of days. And most of our clients come from... Um, yeah. The trout crossover uh, from the mountains where they do trout fishing with fly rod. Uh, people are not very aware of saltwater fly fishing, but the world record blue marlins are almost 200 pounds on fly rod. Oh, wow. Uh, almost 300 pounds, I'm sorry. Um, the largest fish taken on a fly rod was a shark in the lower keys. It was over 300 pounds. Um, most of the fishing that we do is catch and release, um, and we've been uh, very active in uh, uh, the environmental issues. We inform people at the school. We explain the rain machine of Florida and the, uh, uh, the struggle over control of water that this state is facing, um, and... Uh, which is going to have a lot to do with the future quality of life in the state. So discuss exactly how fly fishing is different compared to a standard rod and reel. So I'm sorry? How is fly fishing different compared to a standard rod and reel setup? Okay. Uh, if, if you enjoy fishing and you get out a lot of it and you, you get it in, there are, fishing is not just going out on the boat and hoping something bites. There's a lot more to it. And the Florida Keys has a, uh, a tradition. This was one of the starting points for fly fishing, um, in salt water, um, globally. Um, Ted Williams, the baseball great, used to live down the street and he, he, he was a fly fisherman. Um, uh, Paul Newman used to come here. Uh, George Bush has been here. George H.W., I took him fishing. Um, so um, the difference in fly fishing and conventional tackle is when you cast a lure on a spinning rod, the lure pulls the line off the reel. 
Okay. So the lure has weight. In fly fishing, uh, there's no weight particularly on the fly. Yeah, there, there, there's a there's a typical fly. Uh, it's typical. So it goes along the surface. It looks like a minnow swimming on the surface. Okay. So in fly fishing, the weight of the line drags that fly through the air behind it when you cast like that back and you cast it. And so um, it's that's different. And uh, the heaviest line that you can use, the tensile strength of the breaking strength is 20 pounds, 20 pound test. So that 290 pound blue marlin was caught on line that would break. You couldn't pick a case of beer up if you had it tied to it. A case of beer weighs 23 pounds. So you couldn't pick that case of beer up with the line and a lot without the line breaking. So there's a way that you uh, apply additional drag. There's tricks of the trade, so to speak. And what, what we have found over the years is that you can go out and troll for dolphin and you can fill your boat up with dolphin. Dolphin being mahi-mahi. Mahi-mahi, yeah. 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 Um, you can go trout fishing, uh, speckled sea trout, certain places. You can fill your cooler up. Well, there's a point where people who are involved in spending time outdoors say, well, what's the point? This is so silly. You know, uh, there, there's no challenge here. So what we do is you, we create a little bit of a challenge and you handicap yourself with a tackle. And, and, and that's, um, that's what it is. And like I say, most of the fishing today, uh, is catch and release. If I catch a snook during season, I'll bring it home and invite it to dinner. But uh, or a triple tail, the same thing. Uh, but by and large, you catch a dozen fish and they all swim away. You release them. We're very careful. We've uh, um, over the years we've organized um, um, charitable uh, organizations. Bone Fish and Tarpon Trust is one. I'm a founder. Uh, it's referred to as BTT, the Bone Fish and Tarpon Trust. Um, and, uh, we have done research, uh, and trying to make, uh, decisions based on the science as opposed to hearsay. And, um, uh, or emotional, uh, sometimes in cases stupidity. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned how a lot of the fishing you do is catch and release. Uh, is that something you, as a fisherman, has conducted on your own, or is that something that's been codified by the no, state? No, no, we've, in many cases, we have made the state pass laws to require it. There was a time, there was a time, tarpon are spectacular game fish in the state of Florida, and the Gulf, Gulf, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, uh, they go up to the Carolinas, we didn't know anything about them other than, well, they came here in the springtime, you saw a lot of them, and you caught them, and they were fun. And there was a time in Florida when uh, people would catch a tarpon, they'd gaff it, take it in, they'd hang it up on the rack at the marina, take a nice photograph, and they'd dump the fish for crab trap, or crab bait or something. And we realized we had tournaments we had tournaments, the first tarpon tournament on fly rod was in 1970, 71 or something like that. And we would kill the fish, or they would kill the fish uh, with a gaff. And these fish are, you know, anywhere from, they had to be bigger than 70 pounds, and they could have been 150. So, and they bring it in, we'd weigh it, and then discard it. And um, uh, after I, I got into fishing in those tournaments around uh, 70, 74, 75, something like that. And uh, Eddie Whiteman, you may talk to later. I talked to him already. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, Eddie Whiteman and Captain Steve Huff. Um, a lot of people have Jimmy Albright, uh, um, so the, the whole group of Florida Keys fishing guides and anglers from these tournaments said, "We can't keep doing this." At the time of at that time, five to eight hundred uh, five to eight hundred tarpon. I'm sorry, five to eight thousand tarpon were being killed a year in the state. And this is a fish that lives 50 years. They, they live 50, 50 years, we have found out now. So we said, we got to stop that. And we uh, made it, the state passed a law that the only way you can kill a tarpon is if you buy a tag in advance for $50 and are in uh, seeking a world record. So my guess is all the tournaments stopped killing them. Um, at that time, the guides all over the state of Florida, everywhere, they'd go tarpon fishing, they'd hang, hang the fish up for the photograph. And that got cut out altogether. So probably 30 tarpon a year maybe get killed in the state. So, uh, if you look at that, that's, that's been going on for 30 years probably. So 30 times, Five, it's one hundred fifty thousand tarpon that are still swimming around. Well, wow. yeah, that uh, that are spawning size fish. And the tarpon population is good. Their habitat, their habits have changed, but the populations are pretty good. So, discuss the role of tarpon in the ecosystem. Why is tarpon such an important fish, um, commercially or you know recreationally, and within? The ecosystem overall. So, do they eat a lot of the smaller stuff? Do they do anything regulatory? That type of thing. Uh, what now? What do, why are tarpon important in the ecosystem? Why are they important? What, what role do they serve in the ecosystem? So, why are tarpon such an important fish? Why is it so important? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, they're fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun. They get big, they get very big. It's a challenge. You, the, the fishing, what we do, um, fly fishing mostly on the flats, the inshore waters, is a guide or someone will pole the boat. You take a 20 foot push pole and you take the motor out of the water because the motor scares the fish. The fish, it disturbs them. So you pole the boat quietly. And then someone will be on the front of the boat with a rod and a reel. And when you see the fish, you actually see the fish and you cast to a specific fish. So it's pretty cool to take that and throw it in front of a 150 pound fish. And if you manipulate it right with your rod, the fish bites it. And they jump. They, they're incredibly athletic. Um, they, they jump, they're very strong, they'll take 150 yards of line, um, and uh, they're just, uh, they refer to them as the Silver King, uh, and they're one of the most important inshore uh, fish in Florida for sure, and actually had quite a bit to do with the development on the southwest coast of Florida uh, with tourism in the 1900s. Um, but they weren't uh, fly fishing for them. The first fly fishing really occurred here in the Keys when um, the line was 20 pound was the maximum. At the time it was 12 pound. You couldn't use more than 12 pound test. So if you tie this fly onto a piece of 12 pound and the tarpon bites it, his his uh, jaws are raspy like a, a file, and they wear through and it gets away. But a captain here, Jimmy Albright, invented a knot that you could take a piece of 12-pound monofilament and tie it to a piece of 80-pound monofilament and then tie the fly on. So once... That would get you through the abrasion. 
So the 80 pound of tarpon wouldn't wave with freight through. So you could actually fight the fish, take the fly out. And it made it a legitimate fly rod game fish. Same thing, you can catch sharks. You use a piece of wire this long, has to be less than 12 inches, uh, and tied to the hook. You, they call it a shock tippet or a bite tippet. So, and then you have the rest of your light line and whatever the rig is. So now let's talk about water quality. Okay. So, um, over the course of your career here, how have you seen water quality degrade over the last several decades? Uh, well, it hasn't gone up. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I, when I moved to Florida, there were probably uh, 10 or 11 million people. There were well, a million people max in Dade County, and uh, probably... Uh, Half a million or 750 in Broward. And uh, the West Coast, there was very little. So there were not a lot of people. Historically, um, hi historically, the Everglades system starts at the Kissimmee River, just south of Disney World. It was a meandering river. We ditched it, stopped the meanders, and and allowed the water to come through from the, those areas. It allowed the water to pass into Lake Okeechobee without any slow filtration period through the marshes. We realized that a long time ago, and we put we filled it back up and put the meanders back in it. So we solved so many issues up there. Then historically. In the rainy season, Lake Okeechobee is supposed to overflow and flood. And that water is supposed to come through the prairies and the central southern Everglades and dump out fresh, clean water into Florida Bay, right across the street, and um, Shark River on the southwest coast. Uh, and when you mingle fresh clean water with salt water and shallow water and you have sea grasses, you have an estuary environment, which is probably one of the most productive natural environments for um, uh, for life on the planet. So uh, Florida Bay was filled with sea grass, uh, turtle grass, uh, eel grass, um, different kinds of halidouli, um, so that because there was fresh water coming. At the same time, all this was happening, there was pressure from growth in the state to uh, the nineteen twenty nine Great Okeechobee hurricane. They built a levee, and basically the lifeblood for the Everglades was cut off. They, they basically stopped the flow of fresh water that naturally should come through um, uh, and end up in Florida Bay. So these areas became more saline, more salty actually than seawater because of the evaporation and the shallowness and the lack of turnover. So uh, Florida's history has been drainage, drain, drain, drain. Um, there was no science to understand the damage that was being done. Nobody cared. Everybody was making a lot of money. Uh, farming, development, whatever. People were pouring into Florida. So Okeechobee, when it gets high, when, when the water level gets high, the Corps of Engineers is in charge of safety, and they say it could break. And they don't want to do that because 3,000, 4,000 people were killed in that 29 hurricane. And um, they dumped the water out the St. Lucie River on the East Coast and the Caloosahatchee River on the West Coast. Huge amounts of fresh water. 
Well, Mother Nature never intended any fresh water from Lake Okeechobee to go out the East Coast. There's a ridge that goes all the way up the East Coast of Florida that sent the, that held the water to the West and forced it to come south into the Everglades. So, as a matter of policy and water management, we began dumping it out the water, out the uh, East Coast, and then out to Caloosahatchee. Well, because we're holding it back and because of all the agriculture um, in those areas, and there were times when actually we were pumping water from south of Lake Okeechobee back into Lake Okeechobee, um, and accumulating all the nutrients and, and creating these algae blooms. So when we dump that fresh water into these estuaries at the rate they dumped it, the shock created, um, uh, created, um, seagrass die-offs and algae blooms in those areas. So we lose our seagrass. Without seagrass, there's no habitat. The baby shrimp this big, if you ever go back into Florida Bay, you take a little net, a fine net, and scoop along the seagrass, and uh, you look at it, and there's all kind of stuff crawling around in it, crabs and shrimp, things like that. Without seagrass, they die. They're, they have no place to live. So, so the water management in Florida was primarily handled by the uh, South Florida Water Management District. That's an appointed board, appointed by the governor, um, and they set the policies on how to manage the water, where to put it, where to send it, where to store it, and all this stuff. The appointees, up until, uh, frankly, until DeSantis moved in, were almost entirely um, uh, sugared up is the best way I can put it. They were controlled by the sugar industry. Um, and the sugar industry has total disregard for any other issue. There's very few people involved in it. It's the, the Mott family and the, the Von Hools. The Von Hools were in the sugar industry um, in Cuba and in, um, uh, I think they're in the Dominican. The Dominican operation was basically a slave operation. It may still be, um, legal slavery. Um, and when they were forced out of Cuba, they came here. Uh, sugar was not that big a crop in Florida until late 60s, early 70s, when these guys took over. Sugar's not. Really? Yeah. No, no, sugar's new stuff. It's happened, first of all, sugar requires, in Florida, it requires water manipulation. It requires high water when they want, when they have, need water, they need water, they want water. If it's too much water, they get rid of the water. So all of our water management was based on what these people wanted. They receive it's not truly a subsidy. They receive, um, uh, it has to do with the loans and it has to do with the, the, the rate. So if sugar's not going to make enough money, they don't have to pay their loans back. That's kind of a subsidy. So they, they cancel the loans. So, Millions and millions of dollars go to basically two companies in Florida at the federal level um, to protect protect sugar, which they sold as a um, as a, as something that was required for the security of America to have sugar. We have to have plenty of sugar, and we couldn't depend on the world market. Well, I don't know if you're aware, but sugar in the United States, price is double that of the world market. Everything we pay for sugar 
is twice the price that they pay in other countries because of the protections given to these sugar outfits who have the money to lobby the legislature to make the laws, support them, and allow them to control the water. Now, it's it's really very disgusting. It's what it is. It's it's a disgusting uh, situation, uh, but it's a, in reality, it's the case in a lot of industries that they regulate the industry based on what the industry wants, and not what's good for the consumer or the people who vote. Um, but you also you think about sugar, you think about a cup of coffee, right? You don't think about the loaf of bread that a third of it may be sugar. You don't think about the sugar in a can of peas. So everything you eat is filled with sugar. Almost almost all the things you buy, and, it, and you know what's happened with obesity in this country. They actually used, it's my understanding, they actually used the same lawyers to fight fight legislation against sugar and health that the cigarette industry used. So, cigarettes are not harmful. Sugar's not harmful. Same law firms to fight that. So anyway, it's a sad state of affairs. But what happened is that the water manipulation by um, primarily the sugar industry Secondarily by agriculture, um, additionally by developers, um, has been geared toward protecting them rather than the environment, and that's um, uh, that's where we are today. FPNL just got renewed on their lease or something. They got the cooling plants that are destroying Biscayne Bay with warm water. So this game, national, whatever it is anymore. So it's just a disregard for concern over our resources. And the weight of humanity with 21 million people here now means that we have to go farther to protect it. We have to go farther, and we're not doing a great job with it. it it's, it's absurd. It's absurd in that... Florida has had four constitutional amendments that were overwhelmingly supported by the voters and passed, and yet one of them, the the legislature failed to implement the rules to implement it, and it basically blew everybody off. Which amendment is this? Huh? Which amendment? I think it was of um, polluters pay. I think it was a polluter's pay amendment. And what does that roughly entail? That means if you if you pol- if you cause pollution to the water, you have to pay for the cleanup. The mitigation. Okay. Yeah, you have to pay a different rate to clean it up. Uh, right now, right now we're following BMP best management Preface. practices. Yep. That's kind of stupid. <laughs> No, the water coming off my property is fine. Okay, you're good. Yeah. And, it's not, and that's stupid. It's just stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. Yeah, I think that's one of the big issues, at least, uh, like, who's hold, holding these companies accountable? Who's holding the companies accountable? Are there enough inspectors to go out there and, you know, to go to these companies, check water quality levels? That we're talking here millions and millions of dollars that, you know, if you want to actually regulate, it will cost, but they're not investing on that. They're not putting that money in there because no. it's not beneficial to the groups. No, it's cost, it, it, it costs money. <laughs> Uh, now, I, I'm not sure that the water coming out of sugar, the sugar farms right now. I don't know about the quality coming out of there. I, they're not they're not pumping it back into the lake anymore. And when DeSantis came in as governor, 
the last the last thing that the South Florida Water Management District did. Let me back up a minute. We realized that when we dammed up the lake um, and left access um, to dump the water east and west only, that we basically uh, put a stent in the in the heart of the Everglades, a, a stent in the lifeblood flow of the Everglades. I mean, it, you know, a, a blockage, a blockage. We, we cut it off just like you get a blockage for your heart. So we passed a bill, um, Senate Bill 10, SB 10, which um, allocated the time and the energy and the money to create a reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee. Um, so that's under construction right now. And the, we're going to take water, polluted water out of Lake Okeechobee, bring it into this, uh, reservoir, which is dynamic. It's turning over and then send that water out into the marshes and the water management districts where the paraphyton and the vegetation purifies it, eats the nutrients out of it so that the water passing through it and the Everglades flow, the flow of water in the Everglades is about like that. Yeah. It's trickle. Uh, it's, it's, but in the course of two years, the water from Okeechobee gets to Florida Bay. Or three years. I don't know how long it takes to get there. but It does. But eventually it gets there and this filtration of the natural Everglades cleans it up. So we're putting a stent in. We passed this bill. The bill was a fight. Even, even passing it, the Senate wanted it this big, and and um, and then the House had hearings on it and made it this big, and it ended up this big. It needs to be this big. It's this big. And now, now it's deeper instead of this way and not as deep. So, so they're building that. The last thing that Scott did as governor, uh, his appointed uh, uh, water management district, was lease the property where they're building it to sugar. As he was going out of office, the property that had been selected to be used for this reservoir, he leased it to sugar. And the first thing that DeSantis did was void the lease and fire the water management district. No, I remember that. And he has a water management district now that is concerned primarily with taking care of the water for the people of the state of Florida and our natural resources. And they have been doing a very good job. And DeSantis in terms of that issue has been uh, very aggressive in fixing this situation. I don't get into other parts of politics, but in terms of doing that, DeSantis has been the best choice, and it was a good choice for the governor to do this, and he has stood up for the Everglades restoration. So we're going to get this water back. We we raised the Tamiami Trail. Tamiami Trail was... Uh, a dam, another dam, in that sheet flow of the river of grass. And uh, we've raised that. If you go across the trail, I don't know if you've been across the trail lately, but it's beautiful. You go up, you can see for miles, and uh, and then the water can flow underneath and into Florida Bay. So um, I think they have to do some of that on the uh, on the alley too, alligator alley. But anyway, it's, it's coming together. Money, getting federal money, getting state money has always been an issue. Um, and uh, I don't know. So if we get the fresh water coming back, there's a Florida's very resilient. It's been very resilient. Um, uh, it's possible that we could start to get the grass is coming back. I mean, we get these. Um, uh, seagrass die-offs. Like the last one, I think the one in uh, 2015 or something, was uh, about 
30,000 acres back here. And um, the water looks like split pea soup. The grass is floating everywhere dead. Fish are dead. Um, sponges. Sponges have come up off the bottom. They're this big floating. It smells bad. You can't even ride your boat through it. It smells so bad. It's, 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 it's pretty gross. Um, but uh, anyway, that's what I know about that. So, um, kind of discuss what you were mentioning about the 501c3 um, and the 501c4. Um, talk about the difference between those two things. Well, it's, it's a C3, a C3 is a um, a um, tax deductible organization uh, which is allowed to provide information and educate and inform. There's an algae bloom back here. It was caused by the water coming through here. The water was not good. The water's not supposed to be here. Or it was caused because we got too much water out uh, the Caloosahatchee and into the Indian River and it's killed the sea grass. They can tell you that. A C4 the donor cannot control, cannot deduct it from his taxes. But the C4 can say, the C4 can say, the sugar industry are the people that are doing this and you shouldn't elect these people for legislature anymore. You should elect somebody else. And they can endorse people and say, these are the people that can help you. On the other hand, if you're a sugar industry, you can say, those people don't know what they're talking about. We're water coming off the sugar, uh, or our farms is perfectly fine. Doesn't matter if it's true or not. They can say that and they could say, and you should vote for these people. Example of the, um, the Senate majority leader, all Britain, I think it is, a Senate president or whatever stuck in this uh, bill in this current legislature set a session, it basically, and historically, Florida has been um, ruled by the federal government in lawsuits and capable of managing their war. So the Miccosukee Indian tribe sued the state of Florida. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. And they and, um, they, they sued the state of Florida and they won. And the federal government oversees the measurement of the water going into the Miccosukee, which is also part of the Everglades, all part of the Everglades. Kendall was part of the Everglades. <laughs> so... Um, so the, um, the the state has has not been com capable of managing their water in the past, and the federal government oversees it. So the C um, a C four can say, you oh, know, we don't need to do that anymore. And in this last session, as a final last ditch to continue to manage the water. At the state level, they stuck this bill in that said, well, the, the state has to approve the money as opposed to the budget or the fact that we've already put it in for the, the tax dollars to buy additional property. Um, to clarify, the bill you're discussing, I think it's called SB 108 or something like that, yeah. correct? It's the one that all the Cabins for Clean Water people want. Are tackling right now, correct? Yeah. Okay. That that that's the one. So the captains all went up there, and, and there was a big and and they they changed some of the legislation, but they haven't changed or same in the wording. But it's any day now; it's either going to get canned or it's going to go through. And it, it's not because it's not because um, somebody thinks this is going to help anything. It's because the developers contribute to the campaign funds. The sugar industry contributes huge amounts to the campaign fund. 
I care about the environment. I don't have huge amounts to contribute. Why should there's two people that own um, the Fon Hools or two people that own a sugar mill? Why should they be able to contribute millions and millions of dollars to influence elections, and I can only contribute five hundred or whatever, or whatever I have, or a fishing guide? And why should a fishing guide not get? If you're sugar farming, you depend on the weather. Farmers depend on the weather, right? It's a risk and reward. If you have good weather, you make a good crop and you make money. If you have bad weather, you have the dust bowl that they had and causes the depression. But they have protection against it. They have legislated protection for themselves. Well, if it rains and wind blows, the guides, they cancel, they have to cancel the day of fishing. They don't get anything. Why should why should the sugar industry get millions of dollars in uh, uh, in assistance and thousands and thousands and thousands of fishing guides or dive boat operators? They have their influence is nowhere compared to these people in our legislature. That it's a problem. I don't know what the long term solution is, and and, and with the. Part, part, part of the problem is that Florida is growing so fast, many of the people have no idea what the environment is here. If the sun's out, no clouds, it's not going to rain today, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's snowing up in where I used to live, you know, in 20 degrees. Florida's great, the environment's great. <laughs> And, and that's how they measure it. And then when the election comes around, I mean, when you looked at Rick Scott's ads for his Senate campaign, you would think he was the biggest environmentalist in the world. And he did more destruction for the Florida. He did away with the Department of Environmental Regulation. Basically, he took all their money and he fired everybody and said he couldn't mention global warming or, or, you know, anything to do with that. And and uh, and he appointed a the water management district people who are all cronies of the sugar industry. It, it's a cronyism and, uh, and and legal bribery is what it is. But uh, it's, it's the way the election laws, it all goes back to that. A voter's doesn't count as much as a, a, an abstract concept like a corporation. So how do we as kind of everyday people go about trying to solve these types of issues then? Because it kind of seems like a David and Goliath type of scenario here. How, how do we fix it? What do we do? I mean, I mean, what can we personally do as people that, do, that are stakeholders with water? What can we do to help manage the resource better? What can we do to inform our peers, our community members? Well, know? it would be great if people would stay informed. Uh, stay informed. The more you know, the more valuable your decision-making can be. But unfortunately, that's not necessarily human nature. And, um, and the election process... Um, the election process allows people, uh, allows uh, 501c4s and political action and these giant ones. I mean, some of them told hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, uh, they, they raise that kind of money. And when the election's coming around, people are watching TV. They're reading the newspapers, they're reading the magazines, they're listening to the news, and they keep hearing this name over and over and over and over again, just like you hear Pepsi or you hear Coca-Cola. And they get in a voting booth and, oh, I know that. And people buy the elections. It's just it's, advertising, advertising dollars. They buy the elections and it has nothing. And what the person that's running for office has to do with the ads that are getting him those votes, there may not be any correlation at all. 
So I don't, I don't know. I think election reform is important. I don't think it's, I don't know enough about it to say we need to redress it. But I do know we need to quit bribing. And maybe no entity can give more than $500 in election campaigns. Boom. So earlier you kind of mentioned how fishermen are, need to work with scientists more or vice versa. Um, earlier, you mentioned, earlier you mentioned how fishermen need to be informed by science. How what? How fishermen need to be, need to be informed by yes. science. Elaborate on that a little bit more. How, how, um, do you think there needs to be more of a partnership between FWC and fishermen or the universities and fishermen, et cetera? Well, uh, fishermen, um, fishermen are all pretty independent, but they see the same things. There's, in the season, March through May, there's 500 guides in the Florida Keys, skiff guides. That's this boat that's pulling around pretty much. On the off season, the rest of the year, there's probably 250. Uh, the other guys go to Montana or whatever. But those people are on the water every day. They know what's happening out there. They know where the algae blooms are. They know the water's healthy or not healthy. And they catch a fish and they see the cysts, you know, or, or see things on it and they know something's wrong. Uh, they, they see this and they're, they're much more aware of the relationship of the water and the environment. And, and, um, there's organizations, um, uh, the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust started out looking specifically and scientifically at, at the health of the fish. Uh, and the regulations and everything, but more and more, they're realizing we have to measure the habitat. So while they originally started out doing things like making bonefish all release only, you can't kill a bonefish in Florida. And, um, uh, because of that, and there's also places you can't fish for permit during the spawning season. You gotta leave these fish alone. And yet, fishermen in northern Florida, they actually fish for the permit during spawning season on the wrecks, cause any dingback can catch one of these fish. You, you take a crab and you throw it off on the hook and Pretty soon you're hooked up and the line won't break and you catch the fish. So great, you know. So in some places in Florida, they're killing a fish, taking it home to eat it. In another place, they catch it. There's a tournament going on right now. There's 25 boats in the Key West fishing three days for permit. They won't kill a fish. They will take nothing out of the environment. They're spending 25, I'll tell you what they're doing. They're spending 25 75 by the time they spent they're spending 300 grand down there people are paying 300 grand into the state of Florida for a three day tournament among them all between the airfare hotel food. guide guide fees food, food yeah. they're spending at least 300 grand in three days and when they leave Nothing changed in the environment. That's amazing. You got the cruise ship industry lobbied somebody in North Florida who says the people in Key West aren't capable of regulating their port. They can't tell us we can't take our cruise ships there. I don't know if you've ever been to Key West when a cruise ship comes in, but the cruise ship the water's too shallow. <laughs> they muddy up the water. I'm not talking about a little cloudy. It looks like globs of mud. It spreads out on the seagrass. It kills the seagrass. It spreads out on a coral. It kills the coral. The people come and get to Key, 
Key West. They come on the dock. They wander around Mallory Square. They uh, they buy a couple T-shirts and get a drink with an umbrella in it. And they get back on the boat and leave. And then another 2,000 people come. And then it's just over and over again. And meanwhile, the boat is destroying the environment. And the people there know this is bad. We pass a law and they regulate it. I said, the guy from Bradenton introduced a bill and said, no, you can't do that. And they passed it. They said, you can't, you can't, you can't regulate your cruise ships. Only Florida, the state can do it. And so, again, it's just the lobbies at the state level are, are horrific. Tallahassee. Huh? Tallahassee. Tallahassee, yeah. yeah. Tallahassee, yeah. So let's talk more about seagrass, right? Okay. So kind of discuss like, the major game fishing area. So you've mentioned tarpon, you've mentioned primate. What else? Um, you've mentioned speckled sea trout. What are some other major kind of fish that people come here for? Oh, the stones. Um, marlin, that was as well, right? You mean from uh, the, the seagrass? Um, the, the, the seagrass, seagrass is also more generally sure. The, the seagrass. I don't know if you've ever been to the Bahamas. The Keys had the biggest bonefish in, in um, the biggest bonefish anywhere. And it was like, uh, uh, this was like Mecca. People come from all over the world. Fishing out of the world. Just right? to go yeah. bonefish, just like tar to go tarpon fish here. Well, all of that depends on the estuary. All of it depends on the estuary. The, the fish spawn, uh, tar tarpon may spawn in deep water. I think one of the biggest spawning grounds we've discovered is off of uh, the Continental Shelf off Tampa. Oh, wow. Bonefish spawn various places. It's not red. They all the spawn. The eggs go to the surface. Eggs go to the surface usually, and surface winds will send them into the uh, the mangroves. The eggs into the mangroves. The eggs hatch, and you get a little fish. So they're protective, the mangroves and the seagrasses. If you go to the Bahamas, there's acres and acres and acres of white sand. There's no seagrass to speak of. So the bonefish didn't get as big. Because in the estuary here, there's more food. There's more food. So uh, the history of everything follows food. You know, the history of immigration follows through. Um, so the seagrass back here is a is a nursery for the shrimp, stone crabs, blue crabs, uh, spiny lobster, um, the fin fish, uh, and everything. I mean, that's that's the nursery where those. Animals grow until they become big enough, maybe to migrate. If you have, two weeks ago, we had a big cold front. Okay. We got down to 50. All right. So, but the wind was blowing out of the north. So it got down to 50, uh, 50. The wind's blowing out of the north. It had a falling tide coming from the Gulf, from Florida Bay into the Atlantic. The locals go down to the bridges at night. They put a light on there in the water, and the water's alive with a shrimp this big, migrating out of Florida Bay, out into the ocean. And she said, I'm talking to, so, I mean, I know, I know people that they take a cooler this big, and you fill it up with shrimp this big. <laughs> it's just, and it goes on for two or three nights. You know, they don't really make a dent in harvesting them, but it's just, it's just an example of how many and how important that estuary is to the fishery. So not only, not only the shrimp migrating out of there um, on the cold fronts, the fish that stay, the shrimp that stay, and the crabs that stay are the food for the fish. The, the tarpon and the bonefish and the, 
snook and the redfish, they all eat these shrimp and these crabs. They grow in the in the um, in the seagrass, and the seagrass provides protection for these for the prey, you know, and and, and habitat for it. So the, the seagrass, without it, uh, we have nothing. It's it's a desert. So how about mullet? Um, mullet. Yeah. So um, to my and correct me if I'm wrong here, but historically there used to be a humongous mullet run near the Keys, correct? Mullet. Mullet. Yeah. We have tons of mullet. That, yeah. Yeah. There's mullet migrations uh, in the spring and the fall. In the in the in the, um, in the fall they come south, and in the spring they go north. And uh, and the the fish follow them, tarpon and sharks. Those sharks actually follow the tarpon migration. The bull sharks, oh, really? hammerheads, um, follow the follow the tarpon migrations. And I don't say it happens often, but if you fish quite a bit back there, you'll see and you you'll see you'll see sharks catch a tarpon, catch an eighty pound tarpon, eat him in two bites. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty pretty crazy. So the mullet run specifically, though, is a humongous phenomenon, right? I mean, yes. Millions upon millions. And, but as the years have gone by, as water quality has decreased, as overfishing has you know, increased, this migration is becoming less substantial and less substantial. Um, can you kind of discuss kind of the significance of mullet I, a little bit more? You know, I is wish I could. Yeah. I, I'm not as familiar with the mullet, okay. to, to be honest with you. They, they migrate here, our fish. I don't know the life cycle. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the mullet, but it's a very important fishery in that it's a primary forage fish for m- much of our big game fish. Yeah, tarpon. For, for everything. Yeah. Snook, you know, uh, tarpon, redfish, shark, everything eats mullet. Um, but uh, uh, they, you can see them back here. I mean, they're here. They mud the water up. They feed off the bottom and they... Uh, they process the the um, the mud or the uh, the the, um, the stuff on the bottom. They just blow it through the gills and they filter out some kind of nutrient from it. I don't really know, but it was so bad at one point the mullet were getting wiped out. There was uh, the gill netted them. There were the gill nets in Florida were legal. We made them stop that. You can't. So now the only nets you can use in Florida are handheld cast nets, and they can only be a certain size. Size, and the holes have to be a certain size. But um, um, they were acting. They were gill netting in the Everglades National Park was legal in the Everglades National Park. And you can go and you can catch the mullet and you can sell them. And it's a traditional fishery, and there were many Florida families that had done it for generations. And it was it was a hard to change, but but if they wanted to be on the water, they could learn how to be a fishing guide and not harm anything, you know. And and um, and that's what they had to do if they made a transition. But every now and then the the Gillnet lobby bounces his head up in Tallahassee. Says, "Let's come up with a new law and make it legal again." It's just, it's just. Um, I have a question. Um, do you, your friends, fishermen around this area, talk about these issues? And is there maybe organizations locally, fishermen organizations or groups that are like, "Hey, this is not right. This is wrong. Uh, let's uh, oh, yeah, let's yeah. Uh, gather a group together." Uh, I'm not sure what do you guys do on that end, yes. like organizing wise. Yeah. Okay. This specific area, yeah. the Florida Keys has actually always been a front runner in environmental issues. Um, and we're at the bottom of the chain, the bottom of the creek. So if people pee in the water upstream, it ends up down here. So we got to watch it. Is what yeah. it boils down to. And the state actually made us go on um, a, a sewer system. They made everybody in the... There's no septic tanks in the Florida Keys anymore. And and people fought it. People, you know, God, well, it cost money. It, could, it cost uh, over $100,000 to convert the 
sewage treatment plant that we had in this for this property, the restaurant and this cost over a hundred grand to convert it to go to the sewer. That's for one business. One business. Wow. Every homeowner had, I think, $5,000. Wow. Now, they paid it over a period of time, but every homeowner had to Shut out. pay five grand to, to convert it over. And you, you look, you see the, 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 the vents in front of everybody's house now. It's because it's we went to sewer. And um, so I guess we're throwing it back. We sent it up to Key Largo. <laughs> For process, um, but uh, to, in answer to your question, the the fishery here became started coming into popularity in the seventies, early late sixties, early seventies. Flats fishing in shallow water. It really wasn't available there. Uh, much before that, there were a few guides, you know, and they, and they, um, so because business was primarily during the, the season, they decided let's the tarpon fishing so good, let's have a tarpon tournament. So they set up a tarpon tournament, the Gold Cup tarpon tournament, and um, I think Ted Williams might have won the first one. Um, and um, uh, he was also a leader in catch and release. The concept of catch and release was unheard of. It was unheard of in salt water. You never let anything go. You caught something that was going in home. It didn't matter whether you were going to eat it or throw it in the garbage, but you were going to take it home. That was just the way it was. And um, uh, we started having these tournaments, and we realized the mullet netting was hurting our fishery. So uh, there was a Florida Keys Guides Association, Fishing Guides Association, Florida Keys Fishing Guides Association. There's now also a Lower Keys Fishing Guides Association, and we work very closely together. But at the time, we also realized that the mullet netting was hurting as well as the water was being cut off. Potato farmers in South Dade, if we let the water get high enough, if we let the water get high enough, it would rot the potatoes in the field. So they wanted to dump all the water out C-111 and get rid of it. They didn't want any fresh water retention. So, um, so we had to be active working toward the water control quality. We, the Florida Keys was very, very early on doing that. So we started an organization, we call it the uh, Everglades Protection Association. This was sometime in the 70s. When you say we, as you? And other... the Everglades Protection Association, yeah. the guys here yeah. that were fishing, started an organization. We had members from all over the country. And uh, we had accumulated $100,000 in a war chest, so to speak. And we were five, uh, we were C3 deductible. So we could educate and inform, but we couldn't uh, do policy. And um, we did a lot to get the word out that, that, that these were, these were problems. Um, and um, uh, we're very instrumental in banning the nets. Um, we worked some some guys that um, uh, that came from Texas that had started uh, CCA Coastal Conservation Asso Association in um, in Texas. Toddy Wynn um, used to own the Dallas Cowboys. Um, you know other people. The guy one of the big guys here was uh, Carl Navarre. Oh, he bought Chica Lodge at one point. He was Coca-Cola bottling from Miami, Nashville, Chattanooga, Memphis, St. Louis, and Israel. So he would fly in in his helicopter to Chica Lodge on the weekends, go target fishing. 
So we realized we got to take care of this stuff. And so we had a very strong group of people and we, we were involved in that. So another issue that came up, we wanted to make redfish a game fish. I don't know if you remember Paul Prudhomme, the chef from New Orleans, and the black and redfish recipe. Single-handedly almost destroyed the redfish population of the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. You could take a spotter plane, you could take a spotter plane, and when redfish are spawning, they get in giant schools in 40 feet of water or whatever out in the Gulf. Fly the spotter plane. Oh, here's a school. Yeah, come on over. Take a net around the whole thing. Scoop it up. Sell it. And uh, <laughs> there's just no... They, they, would say, they did the same thing. It was a Spanish mackerel catch one day with the, by the gill nets. And the fish hit the dock in Miami. And there were so many... It got them down to like a dime a pound. It was a dime a pound. They were killing so many of them. Now, if they had kept it up, you couldn't have bought them for anything in five more years. But they were, so that was the mentality of commercial fishing at the time. So we fought, fought those things. So we merged, the Everglades Protection Association merged with uh, a new organization called FCA, Florida Conservation Association. We gave them the hundred thousand dollars, and we gave them um, five hundred members, and kicked off FCA with a caveat: we would maintain an office in the Keys to monitor and keep up with the Everglades water issues. Well, they moved the main office to Tallahassee. We kept an office here and somebody locally to be involved in that. Two years later, they said, we can't afford an office and we can't, we're not going to be involved with Habitat anymore. This is after the executive director of this new organization that we had kicked off moved to Tallahassee and got sugared up. Wow. They said, <laughs> wow. so, Still, CCA or FCA is in the dark ages still in terms of habitat. They do things like, well, plant some oysters. You know, you got to have a lot more oysters than that. And you got to have <laughs> fresh water coming down from App the Apalachicola River from Georgia. And the farmers in Georgia are using all the water. So... So Florida suing Georgia, they lost lawsuit for the same thing yeah. that we're just, we, we're raising hell with our own state. We need fresh water. <laughs> it's, it's like it's crazy. So you mentioned that you were a founder of the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, right? Okay, um, discuss that a little bit. So from from Everglades Protection Association, some other organizations came up. Uh, there was an algae bloom in the eighties. In the mid '80s, um, Mary Barley um, and um, uh, George Barley and Paul Jones and some people started an organization called um, the Everglades Foundation, which is the strongest of the science-based organizations to do with habitat and Everglades restoration, and they're still far and away the strongest and uh, have the most capability uh, to address uh, science about the habitat. And they have a C4 as well, called the Everglades Trust, so they can say whatever they want and fight sugar toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Um, so from the f f uh, Everglades Protection Association, um, there was a our bonefish started, a population of bonefish started dropping sometime in the 80s. 
and it was I can't tell you how it was I mean it was just it was crazy you'd go out to one of the ocean side on the low tide on low income and tide waiting and you'd be waiting along and tide starts coming in there's a bone fish tailing there's a bone fish tailing here's a school fish swimming it's just it was it was absolutely phenomenal but the same thing in Florida Bay in the back country our fish were bigger because of um, all the food in Florida Bay, more so than the Bahamas or Yucatan or places like that where you go bone fishing. Um, and um, so we started losing our bone fish, and um, we were trying to figure out why. So we did things like we, we did like Audubon, Oh, we actually, we said, let's find this out. And some guys got together and said, let's find out why we're doing this. And they started um, uh, BTT, Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, and um, uh, raising money, gaining scientific information. And we still have not found juvenile bonefish in the Florida Keys. We haven't found out where the spawning population is. We have done um, DNA, and they come from all over the Caribbean. Um, at the same time, our fish were uh, dropping population. These fish lived 30 years. They were netting bonefish on the north side of Cuba to the point where they netted them almost to extinction, eating, and they were eating the bonefish. Well, what we found out in the meantime is that bonefish spawn in deeper water. The eggs go to the surface, they get caught in the seaweed. Seaweed washes ashore, and the, these little they're lepicepti, they become little eels once the egg hatches. They abandon ship when the when the seaweeds get into the the shore. Uh, they abandon ship and go into the mangrove and become juvenile bonefish. A year later, they're like this. So we saw bonefish like this, but we never saw them like this. Anyway, um, what we figured it seems like that the bonefish recruitment of juveniles stopped. And our bonefish got old and died. Simple as that. As simple as that. Bonefish don't mi they don't migrate like from South Florida to uh, Yucatan. Or occasionally we found through tagging there'll be one that goes from here to the Bahamas. But very, very so, uh, unusual. So bonefish that live here spawn somewhere here. Well, we know that surface winds will push things from the north side of Cuba to the Keys. We know that. We have rafts here all the time. <laughs> so so that was what was happening, that the bonefish that were spawning in Cuba, those eggs were coming up. They were coming over here and growing up primarily here. If the bonefish spawned out here in deeper water on the ocean side here, those eggs would go somewhere else. So we weren't getting out. We apparently weren't getting recruitment. So BTT got into the science. They discovered the spawning habitat. They're very active right now in the Bahamas, trying to stop some of these uh, 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 new cruise ship locations that are going to destroy um, things in the out islands. Uh, the econ the only econ economy in the out islands is the Bahamas. Is bone fishing. That's the only thing you do on some of these islands, and uh, and margaritas, I guess, <laughs> was the only choices to do. I mean, I think you're making a very powerful point about how connected all these water systems are, how what we're doing in Cuba, or what, what's happening in Florida is affecting everything else. You know how it's all kind of one big bathtub. You know, it's one thing. Yeah, it's one thing. There's no borders. It, it's the 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 um, the water 
that falls out of the sky north of Lake Okeechobee impacts Florida Bay. It impacts Florida Bay and the reef. And it's all one. It's all one. So if if that fresh water that's supposed to come, the Mother Nature had a pretty good system going here. And if it, and the first thing people did was start to change it, drain it. We got to drain it, drain it, drain it. And um, and we realized that was, that was maybe a boo boo. And uh, some people don't care that it was a boo boo because they're making money. And other people want to, you know, protect something of what we have in the history of Florida's environment. So what does the word conservation mean to you? And what does the word, what does the word conservation mean to you? And what does the word sustainability mean to you? Sustainability? Yeah, and conservation. Define those two well, words. Or explain what those two words mean. Well, we've got to, we've got to conserve what we have. We have to conserve the habitat that we have. Um, we we have to have. Uh, I mean, Fl- Florida's rain machine. I don't know if you the Art Marshall rain machine theory. In the summertime, in the summertime, the water. I mean, the land over the um, state of Florida cools off at night. Doesn't cool off much, but it cools off. So when the sun comes up in the summertime or the rainy season, the air heats. As the air heats and rises, it sucks in the moisture from both sides of the state, from the Gulf and the Atlantic. It takes it up. It reaches an altitude. It gets cold and it falls. Every day, we replenish the fresh water on the surface in Florida with with the water from the ocean and we convert it from salt to fresh water and falls so it's a cycle and then it would drain down to the everybody so that sustainability and conservation is making that happen again we've got to make that happen we're not going to make it happen like it did 80 years ago or even 50 years ago this this has accelerated so badly in 50 years that I've seen it. I've seen it. I was 25 when I moved here. I'm 75. It's, it's a wreck. It's a, it's 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 an insult to nature. What we have done. It, it, it's an offense. And um, people don't care. They don't care. So to clarify, we need to. I'm sorry. Do you want exa- we, need- we need to get the water flowing. We need to restore the water flow. Got it. We need to restore the water flow as close to natural as we can. Because if we break one segment off of it, it disrupts the entire process. If you've got an artery, if you cut an artery in the water and the blood goes out on the ground, the heart stops pumping. That's what we've got. It's just, it's just, it's simple. It's it's very simple. It's not complicated. It just it's been impacted by greed. And what does the term sustainable development mean to you? Sustainable development? Yes, sir. I I don't even know that that's a concept in Florida available anymore. I think we're beyond that. We can, we certainly can't develop at the rate we're developing. Rick Scott. Florida had a a, um, a thing called the regional planning councils. So if somebody was going to do something in Dade County or Broward County, there was a planning council with representatives from Monroe, Dade, Broward, and maybe, um, and I don't know, from these four counties and say, well, you're going to do this development, but it's going to impact us. It's going to impact all these other people. We have to do something. Rick Scott, we don't need that. 
Florida's open for business is all he cares about. So they actually did away with the Regional Planning Council. Wow. That's how bad it is. And who wants to do that? It's just like the same people who want to do away with key limes and, 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 and replace them with strawberries. It's developers. It's developers. And what are you building a beach? You're building this high rise, high rise on a beach in Lauderdale, and the beach is going away. The beach is washing away. That's, 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 that's the way the earth works. <laughs> it's been working. <laughs> we, we, so, they're talking in Miami. We're going to build a seawall. How are you going to build a seawall when the water goes around it? <laughs> it's so stupid. It's stu you can't stop some of these things. You can't stop. You, you have to go to the source. The global warming is beyond my grasp. I do believe that the water's rising. I do believe it's hotter than it used to be, you know, so ice melts, yeah, and, and, and if it doesn't get replaced, it goes negative, and then the water goes somewhere, it goes into the ocean, it gets deeper, I don't know. And, uh, so, I mean, we've taken up so much of your time already, but I guess the last question I'll ask you is, uh, I mean... What do you have to say to, to the people who are listening? You know, what kind of last words of wisdom do you can have to say? I, to I don't. I don't think. I think first of all, we've got to draw the line for the Everglades, for the Everglades and natural land. This is like this thing going on in Miami right now, and they're talking about moving. They're putting nine 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 hundred acres in South Dade Industrial Park. And then they're also talking about another one to move the line and, and, and take the highway further into the Everglades or, or that way and encroach with development. And so you got to cut it out. You can't, you can't do it. And you know what? I don't, I don't know how we're going to make it happen. I don't know how, how to make that happen. Um, how many people can Florida hold? I, I think we've passed the comfort level. It just it, sometimes it takes me an hour to get from here to the gym in Tavernier, ten miles away, because of traffic. Miami, come on, you drive on the expressways? Yeah. And uh, there's more people than there are acres. There's more people than there are acres. So is there sustainable development in New York City? It's just a big brick. It's a, is that what our, is that, in, in other words, is that what our goal is? Is that is our goal to be able to hold another 10 million people? Well, it may be great for the economy. In the long run, I don't think it will be. But when when you have a zoning issue or you have a permitting for oil issue to get a permit or rezone a piece of property for a development, people that care and don't want to see a change in it, they, they, they like where it is. We like what we have. Why is our county commission, why do they want to rezone it? Why do they want to change this piece of property from from agriculture or, or single-family dwelling to condos or build a shopping center? Why do they want to do that? Because somebody's trying to influence them. Maybe they got a big campaign contribution. And my guess, that would be the guess in most cases. So... So we've got to stop that development. <laughs> you, you can't. We're, we're beyond sustainable. We're, there's more people here than Florida can handle. It's, just, it's a, it's a, it's a peninsula. <laughs> you know, in Atlanta you can grow 360 degrees, but here you can't. Yeah, here you can't. You can only grow right up this corridor. So, 
any encroachment on the Everglades is a direct adverse impact on your life here, on a person. Most people don't care. Most people don't know. But you know what? Everybody drinks water. Everybody drinks water. That's one of the things we have in common. And we're going to destroy our water source. So the politicians say, That's, don't worry about the pollution on the surface. We'll dig a hole and stick it down in the ground 5,000 feet. It'll be safe. How do you know it's safe? How do you know? You don't have a clue. Well, I know it's safe because my campaign contributions are up. So, anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know if I have a lot more to do. <laughs> no, I mean, well, I think that's about it. Um, well, I think that concludes this interview. Well, thank you so much for your time, um, Kevin. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Kevin Moret. I mean, uh, you really were an absolute mine of information. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I was just taken aback. It's, um, you know, I really appreciate that. Yeah. There's, there's, thank you. You're welcome. Um, let me see. I was looking for another book. But uh, but there's tons of stuff out there. There's tons of information out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Um, there's there's um, half a dozen films, uh, documentaries, uh, BBC, and people about the sugar industry. The sugar industry was a major catalyst for slavery in the New World. Absolutely. Much more so than cotton. Well, I think it's a really funny kind of connection you mentioned, right? Sugar started here in the 60s. Well, that's just right around the time that Batista got kicked out, right? If, from Cuba, you know, Castro came in, right? So it's like... Yeah, uh, it was never yeah, that's a That's a weird connection, you know? It was never a big crop here. It was not... It had to be... Um, the water had to be man manipulated to make it work. And to manipulate the water... Control of politics. Yeah. And we're right there today. Yep. All right, guys. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.